Good morning and welcome to St. Michael's Episcopal Church here in O'Fallon. We welcome especially those who are online worshiping with us this morning. And we are very pleased to have with us a Deacon Dante this morning, who uh, we have sent to the Shota House <laughs> quite a while ago. But we're, we're glad that he's with us today and we hope that he can join us many times in the future. Hallelujah! Christ is risen! risen indeed. Hallelujah. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we might perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the heart.
be with you. Let us pray. O God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the Acts of Apostles. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia, pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took, took a straight course to Thamothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God who was listening to us, she was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer of purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 67. We'll read it responsibly by full verse. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide all the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has brought forth her increase. May God, our own God, give us his blessing. May God give us his blessing, and may all the ends of the earth stand in awe of him. A reading from the Revelation to John. In the spirit, the angel carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the streets of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They need no light of the lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, 
and they will reign forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. It's good to be back here. I had intended to be here, as many of you remember, last week. But I figured out a couple days after the surgery that I was being way too optimistic. So uh, it was a pleasure to have uh, Father Thorpe serve for me last week. But it's great to be back here today. It's great to have a new bishop in our diocese. And it's great to have our Deacon Dante with us this morning as well. So we are, uh, how should we say it? Or running on all cylinders or cooking with gas or something like that. <laughs> what an interesting gospel reading we have today. Jesus goes to Jerusalem for one of the festivals. We're not told which one. And while he is there, he visits one of the many pools around the city. This particular pool was known to have healing properties, or at least considered to have them. Our reading calls it the Pool of Bethsatha, or Bethsaida, which is the name of the valley in which it had been constructed. But it's more commonly known as the Pool of Bethesda because we're English people and that's easier to say. About 800 years before Jesus was born, so in old Jerusalem before Israel and Judah were carried off to Assyria in the north and Babylon in the east, in the rather insignificant valley of Bethsatha on the north side of the city of Jerusalem, they dammed it up to hold rainwater as a reservoir for the city. Over the centuries, the resulting pond was further subdivided into a number of pools for various reasons, and the main pool ended up being very nicely landscaped and built up, having five porticos around it, that is, five porches with stone columns holding up protective roofs. There were beautiful stone staircases that led from level to level and down into the water, where by the time of Jesus, people would swim in order to improve their health. All of this fancy architecture had taken place during the 300 years or so that the Greeks were in control of the Middle East. So in the first century, this pool and the porches around it functioned as a kind of temple or clinic for the god Asclepius. Asclepius was honored as a god of healing, of medicine, of rejuvenation, and of physicians in general, and his temples were known as Asclepions. At these temples, people seeking 
uh, healing could by a little token or a talisman or a small statue representing the body part that they needed healing for. And when they left the Asclepion, they would leave that small model body part behind. The pool of Bethesda was an Asclepion. Later in the New Testament, we find Paul addressing people near an Asclepion outside of Philippi, which was also mentioned in our readings this morning, in Macedonia. Perhaps one of his inspirations for speaking of the body of Christ as a living collection of body parts. This Asclepion thing may seem a little odd to us, since Jerusalem was a Jewish city, but the pool of Bethesda lies outside the city wall. So it was tolerated by the Jews. And since the Romans were now in control, and since they also honored the god Asclepius, the temple and its pools remained intact and in use. But the Jews had their own ideas about the healing properties of the water in the pool there. Every so often, the water would become agitated. And the Jews attributed this to an angel stirring up the water and imbuing it with healing properties. In reality, the agitation of the water was probably caused by the occasional earth tremors common to that region, which sometimes allowed trapped underground gases to bubble up through the cracks in the stone beneath it. So the pool of Bethesda and its porches were filled with people who were ill or crippled and who sought healing. People of all kinds, both Jews and Gentiles. And this pool is at the north end of the city, near the Sheep Gate. Well, the Sheep Gate brings a whole other dimension into this story. You see, when the people of Israel who had been held in Babylon were released and allowed to return to their homeland, they found Jerusalem in ruins. We know this well. The book of Nehemiah recounts the efforts that Nehemiah himself led to rebuild the city and to make it a Jewish stronghold and holy place once again. As this rebuilding was going on, the first gate of the city that was rebuilt was the Sheep Gate at the north end. The gate was actually constructed by the high priest himself, physically, and by his fellow priests. You see, priests could be contractors back then, too. And the reason it was the first to be rebuilt was because it was through the sheep gate that all the sheep and goats would come to be slaughtered for the sins of the people in the temple on the altar there. The sheep gate was the only gate to the city that was consecrated as sacred by the priesthood, and its doors were never locked. Reestablishing a working temple was of uttermost importance when Jerusalem had to be rebuilt. The traffic only moved one direction through the sheep gate, as perhaps you can imagine. Sheep went in, but they never came out. This is significant, because Jesus describes himself as the sheep gate. He says, I am the gate for the sheep. It is through me, and only through me, that the sheep will be able to come and go to be one with God. Now, we often preach about how Jesus is the gate for the sheep, using the image of sheep huddled in a cave at night, surrounded, by, uh, surrounded on the open side by a makeshift fence where the shepherds lay across the, the gate opening to protect sheep from animals trying to enter and harm them. And this is a valid illustration, because Jesus certainly functions in that way. But today's story sheds a whole new light on things, Jesus as the sheep gate also means that he is giving his sheep free access to the temple, to the Holy of Holies, where God dwells among his people. And they no longer are going there to be slaughtered. Now they are welcome there to be with God and to come and go as they please, to live forever in his presence. The plot thickens. So Jesus, the giver of free access to God and the great healer, is now walking around this pagan temple that surrounds the pool of Bethesda, this temple that is dedicated to healing, but only counterfeit healing, really, based on superstition. 
And he looks around at all the needy people there, people whose hope is almost gone, who come to this magical pool as a last-ditch effort to get better. And they've tried everything else. And Jesus, the genuine healer, walks up to this man who is laying on his mat or his cot, waiting for an opportunity to get to that water so that maybe, just maybe, he will be healed. This man has been brought there by his friends or family members faithfully, or maybe sometimes he managed to hobble there himself somehow, day after day for years, in the hopes that he might receive some healing. For years. Have you ever been that dedicated, that determined, that desperate to be touched by God that you go to him day after day after day for years and years and you don't give up because you know that only God is your hope? That's where this man was coming from. 38 years this man had been sick or disabled. That's a long time. And it had to be something debilitating that he suffered from, or else he would have been working. He wasn't there because he had acne or acid reflux. His whole life was on the rocks because of his condition. His life was his condition for 38 years. Jesus knew this, of course. It must have made Jesus both sad and sick to his stomach to see all these people with real needs were going to a place and to a God that falsely promised to help them, when he himself is the true source of all healing. But even though Jesus knows this man and his years of struggles and his battle with his own helplessness and his desperation, he still asks the man a question. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? If I was the man, I would have looked up at Jesus and thought to myself, Excuse me? Duh. What do you think? But he didn't, because he was focused. He didn't have an attitude, because he really did want to get well and be restored to normal life. Why do you think Jesus asked him that question anyhow? I think it's because Jesus knew very well that many people who have been that sick or suffered that long begin identifying themselves with their sickness, getting their identity from their problems, seeing that other people care about them because of their condition and not because of who they are and who they were made to be. It's sort of the perpetual poor me syndrome. We shouldn't sneer because we're all prone to it. Now that doesn't mean that we should lie to people and say that we're fine when we're not. But it also doesn't mean that we should constantly lean on our problems as a way to get attention. We deserve attention for who we are, for who God has made us to be, with or without problems. I think Jesus just wanted to make sure that the man on the mat was not so fond of his problem because of the attention that it got him that he did not really want to get well and to be returned to society where he would have to be willing to be able to work and be responsible again. Well, the man passed the test. He really did want his healthy life back. Jesus healed him. He said, in essence, stop wasting your time here. You don't need that silly water. You only need to know me. Get up, take your mat home, and get back to living. Interesting story. Jesus loves us, but he's not a sucker. He wants to heal us, but he probably won't waste his efforts on somebody who really doesn't want to be healed. Some of us treasure our sickness and our problems because it's all we know. 
And as terrible as those things are, they have become our friends. We use them to get attention and at times to feel important. But this tendency comes from being focused on ourselves for various reasons. We need always to keep our eyes on Jesus and not on ourselves. He is our healer. He is our savior. He releases us from captivity, even captivity to ourselves. Jesus comes to us today and he says, you don't need to be a victim. Being a victim is not what gives you life. I am the new sheep gate and I have taken into myself all victimization. You are now free to meet with God, to sit at his feet, to speak freely with him, to come and go as you please from the Holy of Holies. We should all stop laying around in our personal pagan temples, and we all have them, whatever they are dedicated to. Usually they are dedicated to some kind of our own self-interests. When Jesus asks us, do you want to be made well? Our answer should never be, why? I'm just fine the way I am. It should be, yes, please. I know I can't heal myself. I want a real life. And now let us stand and affirm our faith as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom shall have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are form six in the Book of Common Prayer, beginning on page 392. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for all our family, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For our president and for all who serve, for this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, 
freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, to minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. We pray especially for the people and leaders of Ukraine and Russia, refugees in the countries that are receiving them, and those who have lost their homes and loved ones. We pray for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who claim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Brian, our bishop, for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, our presiding bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God and his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially Alex, Robert, Grant, Anna Claire, Adam, Andrea, Barbara, Jared, Joe, Bailey, Ellis, Ray, Jalen, Shervella, Father Greg, Linda, Helen, Eric, and Mary. Are there others? Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We exalt you, O King, O God, our King, and praise your name forever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what, by what we, we have, have done, done and by what we have left done. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry. We humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in everlasting life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please share the peace. Well, as I said, we are uh, pleased to have Dante with us today as the bishop's deacon. You know, in, in the church, probably most of you know this, but some people don't, deacons do not necessarily get uh, attached to one parish. They belong to the bishop, and the bishop can send them wherever the bishop wants to send them. That's what bishops do. So uh, as long as Dante is with us, we are blessed but he may be hither and thither, depending on what the bishop desires in the future. Um, and we'll just support him no matter what happens. We would like to give Dante a gift this morning. And Bill, would you like to come up here? Thank 
Monday. We'd like to present this to you. A little something to uh, honor the uh, occasion, mm -hmm. I should say. Stoles are a wonderful symbol of ministry to God's people. They, uh, they demonstrate his blessing upon us as well as our responsibility to others. Uh, let me just pray for you real quick. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for Dante and we thank you for these stoles and we pray that you would bless them to his use over the years, that they would be uh, very very concrete reminders to him of the calling that he has um, attached himself to, uh, the calling that you have laid upon him, and the grace of the Holy Spirit that you have poured into him so that he can minister to your people. We pray that you would bless him and that these stoles would be a blessing to him. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so much excitement. <laughs> Let's walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself a perfect offering and sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 Lord, God of power and might, holy, We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things into subjection unto your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with Mary and Michael and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bear all our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Please stand. Let us pray together the post-communion prayer. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the Easter blessing. Would you like to? Okay. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. We were taken aback <laughs> because we've been using this here. Um, but that's all right. Not a big deal. You know, um, I've, I've said this before, and I'll probably say this many more times uh, when I'm among you. But we uh, we worship a God who is uh, a, a Christ, uh, a human being as well as a God. He's fully divine and fully human, and the liturgy in which we participate is also fully divine and fully human and sometimes the fully human parts come across very clearly just so you know that uh, it's not bad to be human beings <laughs> I should have I should have prompted uh, our deacon on what to do uh, at the end of the service but uh, I've messed that up myself so let's not worry about it now it's time for announcements Bill has, a, has an announcement I know Okay, a couple of quick things. Uh, there is a very short, uh, we hope very short, MLT get-together uh, this afternoon. Uh, I would like to uh, mention that I did attend the uh, Bishop's Consecration, and uh, we were well represented by Aaron's uh, work on getting that done. It was done quite well. Uh, if you... Uh, no, we have a strawberry festival we've got coming up. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet uh, out in the narthex. Uh, basically, it deals with the day of the, the event. Uh, sign up if you can be here to help set up, uh, if you can help with the actual event and with the cleanup. We're going to try and make it real easy on everybody. We're going to be doing it out the back door of the uh, parish hall downstairs so there'll be no carrying stuff up and down stairs it'll be relatively easy so uh, if you're interested please sign up on that sheet and I thank you very much Arnie Bob and I want to thank you all for your generosity in giving towards MOA uh, for, for the collections for U USO. And we want you to know that our church put in donations of about $1,800. And the total, because MOA sent out notices on um, email just touching base with people because we haven't been able to have our usual festivals and dinners and lunches and fun things anyway the total amount that came in from people mailing in uh, checks and from getting them here was eight thousand dollars Thanks. So we can be really proud of the generosity that has been shown by the MOA community. Thank Excellent. You. Excellent. Anyone else? One thing I would like to uh, mention is that this Thursday is Ascension Day. And I don't know if uh, you folks are accustomed to attending a midweek service for Ascension Day or whenever it happens. But uh, we will be holding an Ascension Day liturgy here at noon on Thursday. 
It's a, a service put on by the entire deanery, and we are hosting it. I will be preaching. Um, I believe that our dean will be uh, uh, celebrating, and we have a uh, father from, from uh, St. George who will be doing the readings, and I'm hoping that Dante can be a part of that as well. I don't know what your schedule looks like, but good, excellent, excellent. Well, we'll have Dante there as well. And uh, it'll be, uh, even though it's very simple, it'll, it'll still be a blessing to us. Let's walk in, uh, no, let's not do that. See, I, I do that every time, don't I? <laughs> let's uh, conclude our worship with the singing of our last hymn. Oh, 